the coordinator of research at Escuela Superior Politecnia del Lirio. Her research focuses include higher education, internationalization, and innovation. Please join me in welcoming these two panelists, and thanks in advance to all of you for your participation. You can transition the slide, thanks. So today we have a really robust agenda that we plan for the next 55 minutes to have with all of you. Dr. Estatki and Dr. Cisneros have both agreed to start us off by providing us with an on the ground perspective on what is happening with international education due to digitalization within their two respective campuses based in the United States and Ecuador. But before we hear from them, I'd like to first start with addressing some of the critical issues we need to consider as we look at how we can go forward. Today, the world was woken up again to a confluence of mounting global events, a horrific war, diminishing democratic processes, increased medical vulnerabilities, increased wealth and power disparity, and the confounding effects of climate change. It made me refocus my attention on the question again, who gets to partake in higher education opportunities and who does not? And what does that mean for future peace? We are still in the early stages of the digital era and it has never been more acute for higher education to find innovative ways to sustain our democratic principles, expand global learning practices and build human connection. With our shared labor markets requiring workers to digitally upskill, have foreign language fluency and intercultural skills to be able to interact in global settings, higher education institutions are placing more importance on internationalization. Our shared global challenges demand that we in higher education work together to develop long-term strategies that invest more resources into collaboration and partnership and create innovative delivery models to maximize learning outcomes and to better support lifelong learners. If you can transition the slide, that'd be great. Again, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. So at ACE, our organization's research has been built on looking at comprehensively digitalization and how is it affecting higher education from an organizational growth mindset. This has also been guided by looking at principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, data-informed decision-making, agility, and transformation. There are many questions to be asked and answered as we consider more far-reaching approaches for achieving more equitable opportunities for global learning. Many of us continuously engage in reflection about internationalization, its meaning and path, and implications on our own economic security and what we want to gain. As part of our last half hour together, I will be asking all of you to lean into critical conversations with our panel with an eye towards looking ahead and about ideas for our shared digital future in international education. If you can backtrack on the slide, I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much. That's it. So in order to do this, we need your help. We want to maximize our time together. So we've come up with this very short and very easily accessible live polling to capture all of our collective insights, approaches, and key considerations. We hope you take the opportunity to pose your questions through Slido, that's the polling app, as well as answer some of our survey questions in the time that we have with you. We are going to dedicate some time at the end to show the results as part of our group discussion, as well as uh, address some of those questions amongst our esteemed panelists today. So with that, I'd like to turn now the mic to my colleague, Dr. Estatki. You ready, ready Jacob? Yes, thank Amen. You. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Veronica. Uh, thank you to our audience, uh, where we are from. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm currently in Istanbul, but I'm very glad that I can uh, share some of our experience with you. Just as a background, Morgan State University is what we call a historically black college and university in Baltimore, established more than 150 years ago. 
we are classified as high research with uh, close to uh, 8,500 8, students uh, with more than 140 academic programs. And we are very excited that we launched a new 10 year strategic plan from 2021 to 2030. And within that strategic plan, we put an emphasis on globalization and internationalization. And our new Morgan Global Initiative has been incorporated in our training strategic plan as one of the goals. So this shows that the, the higher administration in the whole campus at Morgan is seriously focused on making sure that for the next 10 years, Morgan plays a key, a key role to make sure that their students, their faculty, and their staff are all engaged in our goal of internationalizing our curriculum and our campus. Next slide. So what we've done are uh, uh, great things. So, so I'm just giving you an overview of goal. One of the goals, once again, our new tennis strategic plan has six goals. Goal six is the one that is focused on internationalization. It indicates that we are planning to accelerate global ed education initiatives. And um, we are trying to accomplish two goals. First one, of course, is to make sure that Morgan's global brand is well recognized around the world in order to recruit international students uh, uh, both on our uh, campus in Baltimore, but we also plan to open campuses internationally. And of course, uh, we also want to make sure that our domestic students become truly global citizens by allowing them to study abroad on short term and long term, both face to face and virtually. And of course, we set ourselves some very ambitious goals. One of them is to actually increase our student enrollment, uh, actually double it in the next 10 years, because we believe that by bringing more international students to our campus, they will be able to have a share their experiences with our domestic students who don't get the chance to travel abroad, and they'll be able to share their experiences and learn from each other. Of course, a study abroad has been critical to our university. Unfortunately, in the last two years from 2020, uh, to 2021 study abroad, face-to-face -face study abroad was completely shut down because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, this summer, actually, we are resuming our study abroad activities. More than 75 students will be studying abroad face-to-face -face in various locations around the world. But during that time, we made sure that uh, while face-to-face -face study abroad was canceled, we used uh, the years 2020 and 2021 to put an emphasis on virtual exchange and COIL. And we were very fortunate that we were able to increase our training for faculty and so on. And the pictures are, yeah, that you see on the right side show how Morgan is currently operating on a global scale. You can see it on the top right side, we have our alumni associations, which are international alumni associations, and um, they are doing community service. They are helping us recruit students and they're creating the Morgan brand overseas. Then at the same time on the bottom, what you see is we have launched a new student organization called One Tribe. This is a brand new organization that we started in 2020. We got it approved by 2022. And this One Tribe is really, uh, is more is unity, unity and diversity. is trying to bring both international and domestic students together to plan activities, both on campus and off campus. And just like we are doing, community service with our alumni association overseas in Kenya, we are doing community service on a local basis in Baltimore. So this is to show that, you know, you can be local while uh, acting global, or you can be global by acting locally. Next slide, please. So uh, as we started expanding our virtual exchange and uh, COI programs, we put a lot of emphasis on training. And what we've done is, of course, in the initial uh, year and a half, we didn't have anybody at Morgan trained on virtual exchange and call. So we had them attend the ACE sponsored training uh, workshops uh, with our partner in Japan. And then once we had enough faculty trained, we also sent additional faculty to be trained by other institutions, which are uh, very efficient at developing call. That's DePaul University, the SUNY call system. Now, after about two years of training, we are very excited. They have, we have more than 17 faculty members who have been trained on developing virtual exchange and call. They have incorporated it in their classroom. And our plan now is to start training at least five faculty members every 
year so that in the next 10 years, we will have close to 75 to 100 faculty uh, trained on virtual exchange in Qual, and this will be able to reach uh, at least, you know, uh, 500 to 1,000 students every year who will be engaged in virtual exchange in Qual with their faculty members, uh, and that's going to be uh, very exciting for our students, especially for those who cannot study abroad face-to-face -face due to financial reasons, due to uh, family reasons, or due to just even not having the time to travel abroad. Uh, of course, face-to-face uh, -face study abroad is here to stay with us, but we're believing that by expanding our virtual exchange, we will excite more students to be engaged in face-to-face -face study abroad uh, after they try the virtual exchange. And then finally, our faculty, once they get their training and they finish their training, they see that this virtual exchange and COIL is opening up the doors to a lot of initiatives that they've never thought about so it's actually helping our faculty become more engaged in this new pedagogy. And so it's really exciting. And uh, we are growing, as you can see in the table on the top, our virtual exchange call started with only nine students and one faculty in 2019. That's right before the pandemic. In 2020, we got to 34 students. And in 2021, we reached 142 students. 2022, just in the first four months of the uh, 2022 semester, we already have close to 200 students who are doing virtual exchange in call. So we're trying to grow this number significantly. Next slide, please. And I think this is it for us. So the message to all my audience is, uh, we have accelerated the growth of virtual exchange in call, and we believe that this will supplement and complement our face-to-face -face study abroad. Faculty are slowly being engaged and we believe that uh, this is something that every university, regardless of the size or the funding availability, should be engaged in virtual exchange because it's very cost effective and it's also efficient for both the students and the faculty. Thank you, and I will answer the questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Astaki, for that introduction to your institution and the amazing work that you've accomplished in a relatively short time. Uh, I was just informed that my our colleague, Dr. Cisneros, is having difficulties, technical challenges joining our session, which is unfortunate. So we're going to change it up a little bit <laughs> um, as we try to be agile and reflect the very things that we're discussing here um, in this digital space. So thank you for your patience as we wait for her to reconnect with us. Uh, so if I may, I'm going to then put the spotlight on you, Dr. Estanke, um, to sure. ask some follow-on questions and also to remind our audience to please join our, our app that we have on www.slido.com. You can enter um, our, our exchange digitally with questions, posing questions and answering some of our live polling. Um, I'll put it in the chat once again, how you can enter it in. It's a hashtag USA 2022. So we encourage you to do that so we can uh, have an active discussion. But in the meantime, um, I've, I, it's been an honor to get to know Morgan State. Um, as you mentioned, we did have um, an opportunity to work with many of your colleagues um, in a past program um, that we did on virtual exchange and COIL uh, training. But I was curious um, of where you see this going in the long term in your campus. Um, how are students, how are you perceiving students' experiences going through these types of um, experience, learning experiences online? Um, have they been receptive in during the pandemic? What were the reactions you received? And are you noticing as you continue this kind of work post-pandemic, any changes um, in their um, uh, assessments that you've been conducting with them. Okay, thank you so much, Veronica. So we uh, have learned a lot in the last two years. I mean, the pandemic has, I guess, accelerated pretty much everything. And one of the things that it has accelerated is the adoption to online teaching, to online learning, and uh, faculty members who have never taught online classes, who never planned to teach even online classes, were forced to teach online classes because of the pandemic, because we were forced to shut down. So initially they were very, very apprehensive, but once they realized that they had no choice, then they had to actually, re, uh, I guess, uh, re-engage themselves, undergo through some online training so that they cannot teach their regular classes 
doing uh, using uh, uh, online methods. And so that caused two problems. First, once again, is the faculty, a lot of the faculty were not ready to teach online. Personally, for example, I started teaching online back as far as back as 2010. When they first started online classes, online teaching, I became quality matter certified because I always want to teach, teach online. But even when I saw in my colleagues in the School of Engineering where we are supposed to be sophisticated, 90% of my faculty members said, you know, we don't want to teach online. We want to teach engineering face to face because it's a lot of hands on, et cetera. In any case, when you fast forward to 2020 and COVID hit us, all my engineering colleagues called me and said, Astake, man, we should have listened to you 10 years ago. <laughs> now we have to learn all these things in one semester. And everything that we thought we could not do, even as teaching engineering with hands on, we were forced to learn new methods and new uh, activities. And then the students also had to learn in a, 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 a fast pace. So we faced two problems. One would be faculty faced a lot of challenges uh, technologically, computers not working, Zoom not working, just like our colleague here, where we did two practice with her, Veronica, and on the day of the presentation, technology doesn't work. These things happen all the time. So as uh, faculty had to face that, students, you know, we're a certainly black college. A lot of our students are very low income. They didn't have laptops at home. So we had to ship laptops to them, not to all of them, but to most of them. But then we also realized that a lot of them don't have internet at home. Just so we, ex people expect that just because you're in America, Everybody has a nice Wi-Fi and nice internet at home. And that was a serious challenge. In addition, a lot of our students did not want to turn on their camera because maybe they live in a small apartment where they don't have a space to put their laptop. So maybe they might be studying in their kitchen while their mom or their parents or their, 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 their family members are, are, are cooking. They cannot turn on their mic on because if they turn on their mic, then somebody's going to listen to what's happening. But it was very challenging. Mm -hmm. But despite those challenges, in those two years, we realized that virtual exchange is here to stay. And here's the, the funny thing. When Morgan tried to reopen the campus face to face last fall 2021, we assumed that all of our students will be very, very happy to come back. Guess what? They said no. So 50% of our students are still attending their courses online, although we gave them a choice of coming to the campus versus attending online. So what COVID has done is it has forced students to, in a way, be a, a more acceptable to learning online. Now, one thing we have not done is we have to now have a track record to see what is the impact on the learning. One thing that all faculty have told us is this, my classroom interaction has gone down significantly because a lot of my students have their cameras off. I don't know if they're listening to me. Now I cannot force them to turn on their camera because of what I told you earlier. We don't know what kind of place they are sitting in, but then that's what's happening. They're taking all their tests online and students are missing the interactive, face-to-face uh, -face interaction, discussion, all the things that they used to have in the classroom has disappeared. So Morgan, in fall 2022, we have canceled more than half of our online classes and we are forcing, especially the freshmen to come to the campus. Mm -hmm. The juniors and the seniors can opt to take online classes, but we're forcing the freshmen and the sophomores to come to campus because we believe that this online learning is not too beneficial for them. So that's one thing we have learned just in that one year experience, a uh, year and a half experience, Faculty also are now ready to teach online, but they also prefer to teach face-to-face. -face. But so overall, Morgan used this opportunity to uh, uh, take all our classes, rewire them for full face-to-face -face and online teaching, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Finally, Veronica, a lot of faculty were really tired of teaching online in the first year and a half because they were forced to. So when we came and told them, oh, by the way, do you want to do call? They say, no, no, no. I'm already busy teaching my regular class online. Why are you asking me to do another activity of a call or virtual exchange? So that's why initially there was a lot of pushback from faculty. But once they became more comfortable with teaching online, 
Then they came back to us and they say, oh, by the way, this coil thing should be interesting because now that I have good experience teaching online, adding this coil in virtual exchange for my, of, for my activities is very attractive. So that's why you can see the, the exponential growth in mm -hmm. faculty participation. And also the students are very excited. Initially, they were apprehensive. They didn't know what they were going to get into. But once they got into it, it was exciting. Finally, our students, the first thing they complain about is when they first did their call, we have students from Japan. And you know, the time difference is huge. Mm -hmm. So our students sometimes have to wake up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. to do their call. And then at other times, the Japanese students have to wake up at 5 a.m. and 4 a.m. So they learn that in, when you live in a global and international world, time doesn't mean anything. You have to adjust your schedule to meet the demands. And what we told them is this, after graduation, you might get a job. It might be working for a multinational. So you need to prepare yourself to get up at any time and to be able to work at any time. So overall, a lot of challenges, but we've learned a lot. I'm sorry, it's a long answer to <laughs> one question, but I want to share everything. It's very nuanced and complicated, right? Especially yes. when you are in these initial phases of trying to change a culture. And yes. uh, it, it, I appreciate you covering a lot of bases there in that response. And I can tell it's really ignited some further thoughts from our audience members. And by a miracle, we have our colleague that's joined yes, us. So yes, I, I don't right want to lose her in case there are technical issues. <laughs> Yes, but I, yes. I'm sure she caught a bit of what you were just saying. And, and I can see her. I saw her shaking her head and resonating with some of those pieces. So I'm going to allow Catherine to unmute herself. I know you prepared amazing slides about your institution, Catherine. We can get back to it. But I don't want to lose some of the momentum yeah. here that we're having, especially with that loaded answer that, that Jakob just gave us. Yeah. So if you could introduce yourself to our, our nice group that's with us and, and is being adapted to to our different uh, style of, of our session. That'd be great. So thanks, thanks again for coming in and, and joining us. Thanks, Veronica and Jacob. And thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Catherine Salvador from SPOL, joining from South America, from the Amazonia. So that's why we were having some electric um, electricity problems. But you know that is the reality our students are facing every day. Uh, sometimes it's an electricity cut. Sometimes it's like internet failures. But as uh, teachers and as a university, we learned to observe all the particular issues that may come out. And yes, I agree with Jacob. Teachers usually observe for not saying complain about extra workload. But at the end of, of the day, uh, those who have the passion for teachers are ready to work the extra mile for them. So if you need to prepare two or three extra activities for those students uh, who cannot join for A or B reason, and you uh, offer them an alternative of a work or, or a resource. It can be a video or a link so they can catch up in, in the case of any of these particularities up here. Uh, they are happy because they the students feel the teachers are really there for them. And problems with internet, problems with electricity, uh, problems with your computer not start Team can happen to anyone. And I think something that we learned from the pandemic is to be more empathetic about that. Uh, things can happen to anyone, teachers, students, principals, um, people attending conferences, etc. So yeah. Can you give a little background of your, your own uh, institution's exposure to virtual exchange and COIL? And uh, actually, I'm going to ask Baya, our lovely tech support, to she knows already. I don't even have to tell her. She's an empath. Um, she's pulled up your slides, Catherine, that you've worked hard on. Um, can you give a little background for us in the audience of, of where your institution has really um, worked in this space with digitalization and international education? Yeah, thank you, Baya. Yeah, as um, my university is a public university, and actually it is highly uh, ranked in international rankings. We try to offer um, to our students um, some courses that could be validated in other universities. So in order to get to the, that point, we need to revise our credit system because we realized we, our credit system was far beyond the, the standard. 
So we work into reducing our uh, degrees of six years to four years without sacrificing the quality and the outcome in order to have our credit system similar to international um, universities, which is a bit complicated because if you realize the credits in, in North America are different to credits in Australia or Europe. So we had to find kind of something in between. So our students will have access to um, programs where they could be doing some outbound courses outside, but also um, to allow students coming from other universities to our university. Uh, so this um, international accreditation of our curriculum was um, very important. Also, um, we are presenting our university in two languages. It's Spanish, our mother tongue, and English, because we found that it was very important. We didn't have that before. So um, we were very uh, active into trying to get agreements with other universities or programs like COIL, for example. So we could start these um, agreements to, to, to seek for cooperation, no other among uh, students, but also faculty members. And um, after the pandemic, we th I think we really got into the culture of online teaching is possible, online learning is possible. Uh, yes, it needs a bit more of work, but once you are there, once you have the resources prepared, it's, it's like you have a good um, storage of things and, and resources you can use in your classes. And it benefits everyone, it benefits the students, it benefits uh, students with different uh, learning needs, uh, students from different backgrounds. Uh, so I think it, it helped for everyone. And finally, uh, we um, learned that our faculty and our students needed to improve their L2 level. Uh, in that case, not only English, we're also now offering French classes, German classes, Korean classes. So uh, I think it's it's like a, a mix of various things that are part of our strategy towards internationalization of sport. Okay, great. I just asked Maya to advance some of your slides because I don't know what you can see on your side at the moment, but thank you. I for can see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is this good? I can see the one that says global labor market. Okay, and then and on that slide, this is our, our three examples that I would like to share. The first one is the our participation in a COIL experience where we uh, were matched with two universities, with University of Austin, Texas, and University uh, Arturo Michelena in Venezuela, where we prepared a collaborative online course. So it was one course one section and the group of students interacting in one single project. And the results were amazing. Uh, yes, it was a lot of work, but at the end students gain the, to, to feel what, what it is like living in another country. What's the culture there? They even challenge themselves to use the language. Um, and the second one is um, a collaborative, uh, outreach we had with some researchers from University of Austin, Texas. We we were preparing um, a proposal to get some funds, but then we thought that having some external view could help our proposal to improve. So we met a group of researchers for, from this university, and and we we realized that it was like a coil experience, but with faculty members. Uh, we, we had the same fears at the beginning, we felt the same barriers, but with time we felt more comfortable in, in the interactions. And also the uh, opportunity of interacting in the poster showcase in 2021, where we could see the other experience were very similar to ours, and, and, and but the gain were 
were really, really relevant to, to highlight. So this is the link if you want to visit all the, the posters. They are, they are very easy to follow, and I think we encourage you just to, to feel that this kind of international collaboration is possible. And my next slide. Um, Baya, can I go to my next slide? Yes, um, there are pictures there. Yeah, we had this virtual language of change experience. Just recently, we had participation of uh, university, uh, Morgan State University, uh, in some students from California State University, Dublin City University, so we transcend to Europe. And um, we had two languages interacting, different cultures. And you can see some of the comments of the students and, and I, I think when they are exposed to these kind of experiences, they, they feel, okay, I, it was really nice and I, I can learn more. I learned things that I didn't know before unless I get the um, chance to interact with students or, or faculty members from different countries and other universities. Thank you so much, Catherine. And you know, one of the things that I'm hearing from both you and Dr. Stodke is, is is about the value, what, what happened as a benefit to these types of experiences. But I'm curious of how um, this is being promoted or how are you talking about the results of these great efforts um, within your campus more broadly. Um, I saw some comments in the chat from the audience talking about you know faculty as well as I think students feeling frustrated and feeling like this is another add-on um, to their existing you know, responsibilities and obligations and commitments they have to make for their degree programs. So the value proposition ultimately still comes into play here, right, when we're talking about this work. Um, so how do you feed what you know when you're seeing the results in real time and, and post real time? Um, how are you then feeding that back into the loop and getting that message out? to your different stakeholders? I can go first. Sure. Yeah, so uh, you're right, Veronica. Uh, the, the only people who can convince the students are the faculty. So our highest priority is to make sure that the faculty buy in into the vision and the value proposition. Because if we cannot sell it to the faculty, they're gonna have a hard time selling it to their students. And then in that case, you know, students are students. You know, when you give them an assignment, They'll take it two ways, you know, uh, if you tell them it's a very exciting assignment, even if it's a lot of work, they're going to gain from it. Uh, they will come to it with a better attitude as compared to saying this is something that is due next week or in two weeks. I don't care how you get it done, just, just get it done, then you'll have a different way of approaching it. Uh, overall, our job now is to uh, make sure that the faculty buy in into this vision that COIL and virtual exchange are very critical to the future of our students, especially if you're trying to create what we call a truly global citizen. And what has our experience has shown is that even the more apprehensive students initially end up liking it at the end. Once again, when we did our call with Japan, we did some other calls uh, with, uh, with the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, the biggest concern was, you know, the different uh, languages, although they are supposed to all speak English, they had problems with language, understand each other, but they also, also had a problem with time, time zone difference. But at the end, students were able to adapt quickly, and they were really uh, fascinated uh, by uh, learning basic things about each other. And even if you ask the same question, as simple as saying, you know, uh, what kind of coffee do you find in your local neighborhood? And you ask each student from different countries to go to their local neighborhood. Even sharing that experience was very, very beneficial to all the students. So overall, uh, students uh, will accept it as long as the way their faculty is presenting it is in a more positive way, encouraging way, and uh, engaging. Otherwise, yes, the students will rebel. They're going to say, I'm already taking too many online classes. And I don't want this activity to be an extra activity that really does not any, add any value. So our goal has been to educate the faculty. We will still spend a lot of time with the students, but if we educate the faculty and they buy into our value proposition, 
then the students will be able to accept it uh, more easily. Anything, Catherine, you'd like to add? Yes, um, I think it's, it's a very common um, slogan, no pain, no gain. And when we uh, think about the gains is like, uh, not only the, the university projects itself outside in a different way, but also uh, we are not only preparing our students to be ready for the global market, but also they are getting ready to be global citizens. So the only understanding of what's happening in the other side of the world in, or in another country or in a context outside of your own context, you are gaining. Um, because um, nowadays, um, it's not very uncommon to find people living in one country and working with two or three different countries uh, online or remotely. And so that, that is what where students may face when they graduate and they become professionals. So if they had this experience now as students, when you can kind of see it as a, as a draft experience, when, when you go to the labor market, you, you do it for real in a more serious context, I think you, you, are, you are better prepared. So I would say that um, as an institution, you display the, the university internationally and you expose it into international context, but for students, the gain is, is massive. I, I, I feel they get better prepared to, to be better citizens uh, in a global world, and, but also better global workers. So uh, one of the questions that came in uh, to the discussion was about, again, looking at this determination by wealth, a two-tier system that has developed in higher ed, and trying to avoid this when we're scaling uh, our efforts in COIL and virtual exchange. And I know you gave reference earlier to, you know, having flexibility and adaptability to different circumstances of, you know, internet um, access, um, hardware access. When you're going into working with faculty on evaluating students' performance in these types of experiences, what is changing? in the way you evaluate your students in this work? How is it different from perhaps traditional methods or um, you know, um, of assessment of these courses? Well, I haven't taught yeah, a class can, can in four years. Yeah. Catherine is still teaching, let her go first. Yep, go ahead, Catherine. Sorry, sorry. Um, yes, I think that what happened is before in more traditional teaching, you were okay with get, getting them, getting to know something, but more how they apply the knowledge is more important. And more, more importantly, how to transfer that knowledge into different contexts or into different realities. Uh, again, that is what they are going to face when they become workers or, or they, they start their companies. So I think it's, it's more um, what they can do with what they know rather than what they know. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to ask Bea to take down the slides so we can see our boxes a little bigger. <laughs> and also, I want to share some of the results um, uh, of our poll that some of you have taken. I know not all of you because there can't be some of these results I know are skewed just based on the, the results I'm seeing. But nevertheless, maybe this will prompt you to start plugging in your answers as I show my screen. Um, sorry, Bea, my screen share is um, disabled. And ah, now it's back. All right, here we go. So countries that are representing in our participation here from our group, we have Chile and the United Kingdom showing up, which is great. Thank you for joining. Um, who is their professional role is very mixed here. We have a real array of different folks, which is very exciting to see. Um, we also asked about what departments or where their roles are. And it's 50% um, are in the internationalization global arena on their campus. 
Now, as far as ranking though, on their expected benefits from internationalization, I wanted to pause on this one because this to me is interesting. So there's improved quality of teaching and learning came number one, which hasn't always happened when I've done this poll, by the way, in different audiences. So this is a promising <laughs> result from my perspective. Enhanced international cooperation and capacity building has come in as number two and strengthened institutional research and knowledge production capacity um, have come up as top three results. Um, as far as having any knowledge of virtual exchange in COIL, um, we actually have some folks in the room here who seem to have extensive experience, which is exciting. Um, no one has said they're new to virtual exchange and quail, which is to me remarkable. <laughs> um, so this is extremely skewed, either extremely skewed results because few yeah, folks haven't I participated, it, or those that have and know this stuff are really eager to demonstrate their knowledge. <laughs> yeah, Veronica, it looks like we're preaching to the choir. Maybe we can ask them a few questions. They look like I know. They have no experience, you know. Yeah. I only have two years. I only have two years experience in coil, and I have some people who've said ten years experience. So <laughs> let's hear from them. What have they done? What have they, what have they learned if they can? Yeah. So I'm just going to do one more thing here on the slide, and then I think we're going to, so since we have a sizable group here of 25, I don't think it's hard to ask folks to, to get more active in a normal conversation. Um, looking ahead to 2023, the question we ask is, how can we better support our students, especially international students, throughout their learning life cycle, graduation and beyond? So the answers that we received here, clear expectation setting, right? Strong orientation, looking at their psycho and social well-being and support. That's something I wanted to even touch on as a question again when we're talking about what were student um, reactions to their experiences in COIL, especially during the pandemic. Did, um, did you get any feedback from faculty about their, their well-being um, or their mental health from that experience? That would be interesting. Um, the other answer here was improved faculty teaching, learning, and research skills. So all excellent answers. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And on that mental health piece, um, did you have any comments, um, Jakob or Catherine, that you'd like yes, to share? Yes. Mental health has been a, a front and center uh, during the pandemic, uh, both for the faculty and for the students. Uh, we were really shocked at Morgan when we realized that a lot of our faculty and our students were negatively impacted by COVID. Uh, because they had death in the family, you know, that uh, when you look at the statistics of the number of people who died worldwide, majority of the death were minority, what we call minority, especially in the US. And we really were uh, really shocked that majority of a lot of students and faculty and staff had experienced death due to COVID uh, to a close family member. So that has a serious mental health, uh, a mental health impact on, it, on them. And uh, the president looked at it uh, and he really significantly increased the mental health advisors. We had to actually almost double our mental health uh, uh, advisors. And of course, since the university was closed, they had to do a lot of uh, virtual advising, but mental health uh, uh, has been a scary uh, uh, challenge to both the faculty and the students. It still remains to be a big challenge because a lot of our students and our faculty, they're telling us it's taking longer for them to come out of this challenging time. Yes, a lot of us think that, okay, COVID is behind us, the masks are off, we can travel again, we can do things again. But a lot of students are telling us now in my family that death has seriously, seriously impacted our family, our healthcare, and therefore we're still suffering, not as, as much as they used to suffer, but they're still impacted negatively. So we have to be patient with them and we have to support them as they transition to a, a more normal uh, uh, way of uh, conducting themselves, both in the classroom and out of the classroom. So mental health, we believe that is gonna remain with us. And that's why we wanna make sure that we support uh, not just the students, but also a lot of faculty. That's something that we were really surprised by. Catherine, did you want to add any thoughts? Mm -hmm. I would, I would love to, because I always think that um, the thing that the pandemic uh, allowed us to to do is to get to know the problems that everybody face. Um, we had students with uh, extreme 
uh, difficult situations and conditions like a parent with cancer or, or terminal diseases. Uh, and yes, maybe everybody knows that Guayaquil uh, was at the spot in the news because we had really, really harsh times during the pandemic. Um, but it, it can be a pandemic, it can be a natural disaster, it can be a political crisis. Uh, there, there are problems everywhere. What I think the pandemic did is it opened the doors to all the problems that students, teacher, faculty. Uh, we started talking about burnout uh, of the teachers, but the burnout was not an issue that emerged from the pandemic. It was an issue that was exposed during the pandemic as something that faculty members can, can feel when they are stressed about uh, the various roles that we have to perform as teachers, especially in, in countries where conditions are not very favorable. Um, and on the other hand, when the student opened their cameras and we can see where they live, we really get closer to them. We see what are their conditions. We see that sometimes they are sharing a very small room with two or three siblings or one computer for a whole family. So I, I think that, that was what the pandemic did. It didn't present the problems. It just displayed the problems that maybe were present long before there. So I, 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 felt, I feel it's a gain because universities started thinking in policies on how to better support um, all the community will be not only students but also teachers will be in they start to be more flexible on and how to present deadlines and 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 things that really um, we, we learn to to difference the emergent from the important and then to scale what is really important is your well-being because if you are not um, healthy and functional no matter what you can you're not able to to perform anything a class or 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 just submit a proposal or anything uh in the same thing with the students um so uh, we develop programs for uh, help helping students to overcome when when a family passes away or a relative or a close friend passes away, which is not only a particular issue derived from the pandemic. It can happen to anyone anytime, and but the resources that are there for them are are going to help. And I think this is one of the gains that are going to stay after the pandemic. It's so interesting because I think the mainstream media that you hear about when you hear the words digitalization is almost like a stripping of our humanity. And in this instance, what you're revealing in a lot of ways, both of you, is how it can really um, remind us even more our, um, as we are reaching faculty and students wherever they are in whatever situation they're in, in a moment, right? even though it may be in a Zoom square, there are also other modalities obviously that um, are at play here, but everyone knows Zoom, I think now more than ever is one more prevalent modality um, for reaching folks. Um, I am curious um, from the audience, we have a lot of people here and we've got exactly six minutes I've been prompted by our lovely um, tech producer here. I want to, because this is a great group, give you a chance to unmute or reveal your video if you're brave if you don't want to that's okay um, but to just make this more conversational um, what are your immediate thoughts um, especially from those apparently that have done this work for quite a number of years of where are you seeing this going in the future because this is supposed to be about the future um, of, of our work in international education and utilizing our tech tools that are available right now what would you give as one piece of advice or one hope that you have? Who's awake? Who's paying attention to us? <laughs> Hopefully they have they don't have a problem unmuting and speaking. Yeah, that's true. I did have one question come in in the chat from sure. Rob Segan. Uh, 
he commented, a compliment, excellent presentations and discussions. Thank you, Rob. I think the points on the different responses to going remote are especially interesting. Wondering if there have been discussions at the universities about way to increase student experiences outside the classroom. Examples, connectivity and physical space. So maybe we can give a little bit about further, maybe on, on what we mean by these COIL experiences. Um, most of the experiences are taking place outside the classroom, correct? Correct, yeah. The students do their initial uh, exchanges online, but then a lot of the activities, the assignments, they have to do offline, and then they go back online to exchange their experiences, their results. So it's, it's, it's not all happening online. The initial phase is online, then the students have to do their own activities uh, on, the, on their local campuses or local communities, and then they return back and then they share their experiences online. So I don't think that uh, the COIL just is limited to that online interaction. I think that it's actually even making our students more engaging to their local community. As an example that I gave one of the classes, asked them to find out what kind of coffee or something is being so sold in your neighborhood. So students were really excited about going to their local coffee shop, taking pictures, even doing FaceTime with their friends from around the world. And they got a different perspective. So. Uh, uh, the virtual exchange, if it is designed properly, might create a more engaging uh, uh, community on a global scale. Hey, Rob, thanks for revealing yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and thank you guys for the, the great presentation. I think it's super important topics to really appreciate you guys raising it. Um, and I think, yeah, just to what Jakob was saying, what we found with the students that we're working with, there's kind of very different dynamics or experiences between the students who have kind of their own space and desk and kind of great connectivity. And then students who really don't have that and are kind of, you know, every day they're in like a different place. So they're kind of running around. And it, I don't, it's not really a question because it, I think it's just like a really, there's no quick answer, I don't think. But just um, it's interesting to hear your guys' perspective on that in terms of, and I think there was a point, a question in the silo someone else raised about this dual level or dual mm -hmm. tier system that this could potentially create between the people that have great connectivity and spaces and don't. So, no, it's a good yeah. observation. I think, and that's where I was trying to lead the question before when I was talking about how do we then evaluate our students and, and what they're gaining from this. And I think, so one of the things that I valued a lot about, particularly COIL, which is only one method, there are many different kinds of ways to connect to get really creative online. But we found with COIL, especially because it is project-based, they're connecting two different classrooms, right? To work together jointly on a project and it come, come from very, very different subject matter areas. It's not necessarily about what they're gaining on or how effectively their settings are or how efficient they are um, with having a, a digital access. It's more about what are, what's the process they're going through to overcome these challenges together. Are they willing to collaborate? Are they willing to work together? It's more about the process that they go through and seeing how they make that effort to be empathetic to be flexible, right? To be able to come overcome these challenges and differences, um, and and see commonalities together to through throughout the project outcomes. Not necessarily that they've produced um, the most um, technologically savvy presentation, um, but more of the the journey that they took together and were willing to take together. Um, and that building in then as a global competency, how is that then reviewed by your by the institution holistically is where I'm the most interested in seeing because you know there's been the traditional value sets of knowledge and skills, um, even digital literacy has become more commonality. But when we're talking about these even, I hate the word softer because to me they're not softer, they're the most critical skills <laughs> um, to come out of these experiences. How do we then give that value to them, right? And how does that transcend to, to the students seeing this as a part of their career pathway? Um, I can't give you solid answers. And I know institutions are grappling with this still to this day. Um, we're just getting started, I think, in this space of really seeing what's the best practices and what's the most effective. But if there are folks here that can share some insights, um, 
that'd be great. We can do it offline because I know we're at time, <laughs> unfortunately. But we made it through technical challenges. And thanks, everyone, who's been sticking it through here with us. Um, we certainly invite you. I'll have the Slido open so you can continue to send us questions. And we'll make sure to answer them um, as fast as we can uh, amongst our panel here. So thanks again so much, Catherine, for taking the time and efforts through all those challenges to be with us today. Jakob, too, you're coming in from another area. And I know you have to get on a plane very soon. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's great to see both of you. And thanks to everyone for joining us. It was a pleasure for us to join. Uh, Veronica, thank you for organizing such a very interactive session. And I hope the audience learned from us the same way we learned from them, especially the questions were amazing and they helped us reflect more on what we need to do going forward. All right, take care.